I would swim for the two of us I would swim and Be all you can be All you can breathe I believe in you Do you believe in me? We're gonna make it, make it We're gonna make it Compass and today I'm here with Aruba Red. How are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. Good. And what is an average day for you at the moment? An average day, I guess, um, writing music, going in the studio, doing a couple of little interviews like this, um, maybe doing a gig, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And how are you coping with the lifestyle generally as being a working musician and singer? I think um, it's something that you just you do it because you want to do it and um, I quite like not having the same routine every day I like having a few surprises and not knowing what's happening from week to week um, I grew up traveling quite a lot so I guess the I don't know if upheaval is the right word <laughs> but just the kind of random schedules and timetables work, work well for me I was going to ask about your childhood because I think you were born in Germany but you went to Essex and San Francisco? Yeah, we travelled around quite a lot. My dad's a musician as well and was lucky enough to get to tour with him from a really, really young age. Um, so yeah, I was born in Germany and then um, lived in Scotland for a while, Suffolk, Essex, San Francisco while my dad was recording an album out there. Um, and yeah, most recently London. And obviously where you live and where you go shapes who you are, but are there any songs or any lyrics that you say that was from that moment or I can pinpoint that country made that lyric happen? Or um, I don't know if it's the countries necessarily, but maybe more, more the experiences. Um, a track that I put out for free download recently called Never Die, that was kind of a, a real documentation of like, kind of between the age of like 16 and 18. Um, kind of a few uh, like quite sad things that happened during that time and trying to make it into something positive I guess and never die kind of means that love will never die so yeah that's kind of what that song is about sort of optimistic although dark at the same I time so yeah. yeah that's kind of a good overview of what I do I think <laughs> would you say you're generally an upbeat person though with just dark undertones or I think that's a really good description I might have to quote that okay full break <laughs> again <laughs> Optimistic with uh, dark undertones. Yeah, yeah, I think that sounds good. No, I think you have to be optimistic. I think I'm really grateful um, and lucky to be able to do what I do as a job. Um, there's a lot of people in the world who don't get to do what they want to do, whether it's you know working in a call centre or working on a banana plantation or whatever. There's like all different levels to it, and and I think being able to sing or be creative and, and survive off of it is like a really is a big blessing. Um, but at the same time, I think often the things that motivate people to make music can have, you know, darker connotations and maybe things that you've gone through or things that have affected you and they're not necessarily always good things. Yeah. But if you can make that pain into something positive, then, you know, it can be a good thing in the end. Yeah. Do you find that you are more creative when you're in a particularly uh, stressful time or there's turmoil going on or are you better when you're, like, really uplifted and happy? I think different songs will just come out of different periods. I don't think I'm necessarily one of those people that will only create when I'm really depressed or down. Um, you know, I love to write when I'm happy as well, but obviously whatever state you're in, a different type of mood will come out in the music. So it just depends on, yeah, what's happening at the time. Do you have like a ceiling point in terms of how uh, personal you will write the lyrics and how much you let out to the public? Is there a point where you go, okay, I don't need to share that? I think I definitely used to. I think when I first started writing my own songs, I was motivated a lot more by kind of global events and things that affected me on a, not necessarily a political level, but just things that kind of made me angry or whatever. Whereas more recently, I've been trying to strip back the layers on myself and really write and sing about things that actually have happened to me personally and, um, and things that are kind of quite painful to talk about, but maybe people can then relate to it more. And I think it's those things that when you can connect with people on an emotional level that's when you really connect with people so it can be difficult and it can be like oh do I want to really go there you know whether it's talking about people you've lost or 
you know, difficult relationships. And there have been a couple of times, like, one of, one of the songs on my new EP called Ty and Earl Grey, that's kind of about a really difficult um, situation that happened a few months ago. And the person that was involved in that was really uncomfortable about that song going out. And then you kind of have to weigh up, do I want to hurt this individual by putting this song out there? Or do I want to help other people who are kind of going through the similar thing or, or is it just something that I need to do for myself selfishly to kind of process the emotions Artic, do you know what I mean yeah so you kind of have it is, it is a line and I've spoken to friends like who you know written songs about whether it's their parents or kind of emotional things they went through as kids and it, it is that line as an artist how ex, you know explicit I guess are you willing to go or, or, or deep within yourself I think there's ways of doing it without um, necessarily making it obvious like who it's about. So you can kind of still go through the process without doing an M&M and kind of talking about, you know, putting your <laughs> wife in the, the car or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it's about getting the balance right. And what, how are you when you have to perform those really emotional songs live? Do you ever get like the wobbly chin or well up at all? Or can you just keep strong? Um, I think if that happens, it can be a real benefit because you know that's that's then it's really real and I think that's what it's about I always when I'm trying to sing any song that I've written I try and go back into that mindset that I was in when I was writing it or at the time when it happened what made me want to write about that situation and I think that's when it is something real and then people are more likely to identify with it um, I think that's why you know artists like Adele have done so well because when people are watching her performing and it just feels so real and you can see you believe the heartache, it. you believe it and then people just you know connect with it 100% on an emotional level and I think that's a really positive thing. And do you get lots of messages on Twitter and on the comments on YouTube that people have said that that's helped me or I can relate to that song, do you get that a lot? Yeah it's really nice, like, to be honest like, there's been times when I think a lot of artists go through this where sometimes you're not feeling as positive about yourself or you're not sure whether what you're doing is working and you, it's kind of difficult to carry on you're kind of thinking oh you know am I supposed to be on this journey and then you might receive like a message on Facebook or, or on, on Twitter or someone might send you an email and they'll just tell you about how this one lyric or this one song helped them through something or they identified with this and you know they appreciate it and to be honest those people might not realize but I think those messages are even more important to the artist than it is as the song is to the person listening to it and it's kind of a real exchange of those emotions because those messages can then really help you carry on doing what you're doing because it makes you think okay yeah there is there is a point to all of this people are listening and getting something from it yeah exactly but how do you deal i don't know if you've had any at all but if there's negative criticism or a bad review how do you cope with that or how will you cope with that do you think i'm not very good at it to be honest i'm not gonna lie i think i think it's all about developing a really thick skin and and i think um the way that I've got better at it, I've been lucky, like generally people are really supportive and positive, but I do understand that um, the more your work is about, there's going to be more likely that people aren't going to like it. And I think especially within the era we're in at the moment, YouTube comments can get really you know, nasty and horrible <laughs> okay. and it's something that you have to kind of take on board. If I want to do this as a job, I have to either you know, do what some artists do, which is literally not read any article or any review. Yeah. But I'm quite, you know, I will read what people say and, and, and it does sometimes affect you. But I think what I've, what I've come to realise is that the kind of music that I like and the artists that I like generally are quite left field and a bit more underground and a little bit more different. They're not 100% mainstream pop artists. So if those are the kind of people that I like, I can't expect everybody to like what I'm doing. Yeah. It is more of a kind of a left field, you know, underground type sound. So if everybody doesn't like it it's not a bad thing and you, you can't there's that need to want to be liked otherwise people wouldn't be going up and you know exposing themselves and kind of singing and, and putting all that across but if you're going to do it you have to take the bad with the good and, and yeah I think you just have to develop a thick skin and just take positive criticism you know con uh, constructive criticism take it on board let it help you you know develop become better but when it's just comments like just create it to hurt or whatever you just like the to, trolls you yeah know. exactly yeah. you just have to kind of let it go and you know the most amazing artists get criticized so you just have to think you know it's part of part of it
really. Is there anything else about, say, if you became commercially successful, is there anything else that would scare you, perhaps losing control over your sound or anything like that? I'm not so worried about losing control of my sound because I think um, the kind of music that I make, the type of people that are drawn to it, understand that it is what it is. And, and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm always willing to take people's opinions and and uh, what I do is a really collaborative process between the producers that I work with and, and um, you know, we build sound up together. There's a few different people that I'm working with at the moment. My really good friend Camilo Torado, who I write a lot of stuff with and produce a lot of stuff, and he also... Um, does the live electronics in my band and then been working with a really great artist uh, producer called Nutty P who's half of Stinkerbell and um, it's kind of that edgy kind of different sound that is at the heart of it I think people that would want to get involved would understand that yeah. I'm not really worried about losing losing that I think um, you could just kind of have to take it as it comes and it depends on what type of artist you want to be you know there's people that are at the top of the pop game commercially, you might get somebody like Rihanna, for example, who she needs to be in that public eye 24-7 to maintain that status. And, you know, she does it incredibly well. Then you've got artists like, you know, Erica Badu, who you might never see a photo of her on a red carpet in your life, but she's still got a very successful, amazing career, which, you know, I look up to and think, wow. So I think there's a lot of choice. It depends what kind of thing you want to do, what kind of artist you want to be perceived as, and what's important to yourself. And it's just about getting it right. <laughs> now, I was going to ask you about Camilo because I've seen you tweet him quite yeah. a lot and he, he does sound for Talvin Singh, yeah. he's a percussionist, he's your producer as well. So how did that come about, that collaboration? I met Camilo a couple of years back when he was working with an amazing artist called Nitin Sawney and Camilo was actually doing a whole year apprenticeship with Nitin and um, which I think was amazing because he was getting to work on all the different projects that Nitin was working on. And then I got involved in a kind of um, a youth project type thing uh, called Aftershock, which kind of brings all different artists together. And um, Nitin Sawney was the musical like director of it. And we would have a certain amount of days to kind of create a whole new kind of repertoire of songs and music with these people that we'd never worked with before. And Camilla was one of you know the people on there. And um, then we got residency at the Royal Festival Hall together for 18 months as emerging artists in residence. And um, we were kind of, first of all, he started doing percussion with me and we were working on different things, but it, it's only been like the last year or so that we've been working on a production level. And it's weird because sometimes you can be like, oh, you know, I haven't got the right person around me at the moment. It, it, and, and sometimes it can be right in front of your face. And yeah. like, it was that kind of situation. And as soon as we actually, got in the studio together he was kind of moving house and we didn't have like a proper studio to go to so we kind of built one in the spare room in my flat <laughs> kind of duvets on the windows and stuff to keep the sound in High tech. And, yeah like really all that the whole ep was recorded there like we didn't have a sound booth we didn't have yeah. you know any professional kind of mixing desk anything like that but it was just that really raw organic sound and it just worked so well and um yeah i love working with camillo and he's involved in a load of really interesting projects and um, definitely someone that I see as really integral to the Aruba Red sound. Yeah. And do you ever spark off each other in terms of do you ever butt heads or is it always you're on the same page with every idea and every concept? To be honest, um, I think when there's kind of conflict in, in something, it's not a bad thing. I think within music, especially like with anything, different ideas can, you know, and you end up getting to a better point. But with me and Camillo, to be honest, like he's got this really zen kind of calm just attitude and is really nice to work with like that. I can get a bit more neurotic and a bit more like whatever the word is. So I think he kind of helps balance me out. And um, we've never really had a, a big, I can't think of one where we've ever had a problem like within the studio where we've disagreed. Probably curse that now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think we've also had, kind of growing up, um, a lot of similar tastes in music and kind of similar influences and, and stuff. So I think that really helps where we're kind of on the same page. It works. Now, your music's been described as being trip-hop, dubstep, uh, uh, what's the other one, minimalist, electronic, reggae. <laughs> so does that mirror your own CD collection? Do you have all of those sort of vibes yeah. going on? Yeah, definitely. All those genres that you mentioned are kind of pretty spot on um 
I call what I do rebel soul music so I think soul is at the heart of it and there's always something a little bit rebellious about what I'm doing um, but I take a little bit from all those different genres and um, yeah my CD collection is kind of everything from folk to reggae to yeah more recently dubstep stuff got up listening to a lot of hip hop and then trip hop as well like Tricky is like a massive um, influence on what I do and yeah I guess I want to make music that is just true to myself and, and it's just kind of a, an influence kind of mashup of all that stuff and then it, it amalgamation. comes out amalgamation yeah that's not a good word <laughs> comes out sounding you know like something different but you can recognise all those sounds within it and do you think Demos in Disguise pretty much sums you up do you think it's got every element that you want to get out there or I think Demos in Disguise is definitely leaning towards more of the electronic sound that I have. Um, I think I'm a big believer that if a song is a good song, you need to be able to perform it acoustically as well. So I think sometimes you can hear these really big produced tracks and you know it's yeah. really loud and it works in the club and it gets people dancing and everything, but then you also have to be able to just play it on a piano and sing it or play it on a guitar and sing it and then people can really identify with the words and understand what you're actually singing about. Yeah. So I think um, Demos in Disguise is leaning more towards the electronic side of it, but then you can, like for example, there's a song on there called We're Gonna Make It that me and Camilla wrote. And then just before we put the EP out, I went and recorded an acoustic version of it with my guitarist Charlie and an amazing cellist uh, called Diana Witter Johnson. And the three of us did a version of it and I love that version as much as I do the electronic one. So I think it's about the song. Yeah. And if it's a good song, you should be able to kind of perform it in any genre or with any kind of production, and the song will still kind of shine through. Do songwriters, are they a big inspiration to you, like the classic songwriters as well then? Yeah, I mean, I didn't kind of grow up thinking, oh, I want to be able to write like this person or this person. I think writing for me started off as um, more of like a release like I just started writing lyrics and poetry from really young never would have dreamed of reading it to anybody or performing it or anything and I, I wasn't one of those kids that was kind of in the school play and like <laughs> singing in front of people and like jazz hands yeah all that kind of stuff I was really quite I don't know kind of didn't really want to perform in front of anybody and it was more just a release of, of like stuff that had to come out and then as I got older I kind of um, did a bit of performing at a few open mic nights and became more comfortable with it and then I started enjoying it and kind of that feedback that you get from an audience can really help you do what you do so that kind of came afterwards. Um, so with songwriting like obviously yeah there's a lot of people that you can think wow yeah it's amazing what they do but I think for me it's just always been sometimes you actually you don't even feel like you're creating the song it just feels like you're almost like it's coming from somewhere else and you just happen to be the body, be that's, the body carrying that's carrying it. it. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. And I think um, it's kind of like you're a vessel for it's coming from somewhere and, and you just have to kind of get it on paper or, or record it onto your iPhone or whatever. Like it's and your then, job, your role in the universe. Yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. And um, I think it's probably the same with writers and the same with, with painters and any kind of art. Mm. Some, I don't really sit down and think, oh, yeah, I'm going to write a song about this today. It's never that's never happened for me like no. I'd literally be doing something else and it will just happen and I think when I took it from being a hobby to trying to do it as a profession I had to learn how to harness that and then because obviously if you've got studio time booked or whatever you have to then be able to do it during that time no pressure yeah exactly <laughs> so that's then another skill in itself is yeah. learning how to do it when you need to do it yeah. and that's a little tough but you know I guess that will come the more you do it yeah hopefully <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned Charlie and I think he um, also guitars for Maverick Sabre yeah he does so, so yeah. how was that tour in March for you? the March tour with Maverick Sabre and Miss Dynamite was amazing um, yeah Charlie Laffer my guitarist he came um, and did a little guest spot on all the shows we came and did a song of ours called Getaway Driver which was really nice I did that because the whole set was live electronics we've got Quake bass on the drums it's quite confusing his name's Quake bass but he plays drums <laughs> yeah. and then Camilla doing the live electronics on the laptop and, and all the all the Ableton Live and everything. But I still wanted to show, like I said before, about the whole acoustic thing being quite important to me. Yeah. So within the set, Charlie came on stage and we performed one song acoustically. The whole tour was amazing. Um, Maverick Sabre fans and Miss Dynamite fans obviously love great music. Um, came really early to all the gigs. So 
you know, even though we were first on, every venue was packed already, really nice response. We sold out all our new Ruby Red t-shirts and it was just a really, really, you know, loads of new follows on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And it was just really nice to, to kind of be put in front of people and then they actually leave remembering who you are and, and want to hear more. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity and I love touring. I, I would just be on the road all the time if I could be, <laughs> to be honest. That's definitely the lifestyle that suits you. Oh, yeah, and I like it. It's kind of a bit of an escape, really. You don't have to deal with reality. You just have to deal with day by day, which is nice. How do you deal with not having like all the girly things that we're used to at home when you're on the road? No, I just take a big sip. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I like it because you just have with you what you need. Yeah. And each day is kind of, you've got, your goals, you know, you need to get here on time and yeah. I've got a really great tour manager, um, Anna from Driving You Crazy, she's great. And um, it was just nice to just have, you know, do what you need to do each day and then and just make sure you deliver a good performance. Yeah. And then when you get a day off in a new town, you can go and exploring. do some exploring and, you know, meet new people and, yeah, I just really like it. And when you're on tour with the likes of Maverick Sabre and like Natty and you've, I think you're open for Soul to Soul as well, yeah, do you yeah. go up to them and say, give me advice, I want to hear everything you've got to say about the industry or do you stand back a bit? Um, with Natty it was really nice because I've supported him on tour twice and um, we just became really good friends and I've kind of worked alongside Natty with different projects kind of ever since and he has given me a lot of advice but I don't think it's kind of like going up there and being like, oh can you help me with this, can you help me with that? <laughs> yeah. Because Every artist, I've realised, whatever level they're at, they're still trying to do their own thing and, and no one can do it for you or yeah. give you this magic kind of whatever to make it happen yeah. for yourself. You have to make it happen for yourself. And um, I used to think, oh, if only I had a really good manager or if only I had a really good booking agent, then yeah. this would happen, this would happen. But I realised it's not about that at all. It's about the music, it's about the songs. And then if people connect with them, everything else will kind of fall into place. So obviously being around Maverick, being around Natty, it's very inspirational because um, you can see the, pro the process and the progress and, and you can like take inspiration from it. But I don't think you can expect anyone else to do it for you. Yeah. But obviously advice is always good. But yeah, you can't kind of be too like <laughs> pestering people otherwise they'll just get, you know. Not good for the street cred either, is it? It could be, but... And also, I think you, you had a track with um, Plan B, with um, Riz MC. So yeah. how did that collaboration come about? So Riz is someone that I also met through Nitin and Sawney the same time that I met Camillo. Riz was uh, one of the emerging artists in residence at the Royal Festival Hall at the same time as me. Um, Riz is another person who's just, like, hugely inspiring. His acting career is just doing amazingly at the moment. Yeah. You know, he's been in so many films and Ill Manners is coming out soon um, which was co-edited by my friend Farah from DNR Films I have to get that a shout out yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the world gets smaller you you meet different people everyone kind of knows each other so me and Riz were already friends and I actually recorded that track with Riz a while back mm -hmm. but I just did some backing vocals like Riz called me up and was like I'm in the studio in Hackney can you come and just like just put some backing vocals down. So I went down there, it was like one in the morning and I just went down there, really dark, twisted, kind of quite a disturbing song. But I really like it, I think it's really, really good. Um, so yeah, I just did some backing vocals on it really, like credit goes to Riz and, and the producer on that one. And then a few months afterwards, um, my friend told me, oh, you know, Plan B's gonna do a verse on the track. And I was like, okay, that's, that's really cool. Um, I've met Plan B a few times through other people and um, I was lucky enough to see a little kind of pre-final version of Ill Manners like Ooh. at the editing suite so it's kind of I guess people just know each other and that's how that came about and I'm really happy to be on a track with him. Can you tell us was it yes or no on the Ill Manners? Really, yeah very <laughs> gritty very real um, I definitely recommend everyone goes and checks it out what I do know is, is that a lot of hard work has gone into that movie and yeah. I really think it's paid off yeah. <laughs> You'd be pleased to hear that one. <laughs> now, what's next for you? Because I think I saw a tweet saying a Natty video. Oh, well, yeah, Natty's filming his new video today. Um, so we're going to go down there and check that out. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I think he's just there's going to be a lot of different people in that one. So he's got a new mixtape coming out, I think, in a couple of weeks, which I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, I did backing vocals for him on a track as well. 
Um, I love Natty's music. I think he's, he's a wicked artist and always really excited to you know hear what he's got coming out. So yeah, we're shooting his video today and um, I'm doing another interview after this. Next week I've got a gig with Riz actually. I'm opening for him. He's got his single launch for a track called All In The Ghetto. So I'm performing there. And then I'm performing with Natty at Passing Clouds a week after that. And then just got some festivals to look forward to. Getting some really cool remixes done for Demos in Disguise. So we're thinking about putting out another kind of remix bundle EP off the back of that. Got a new video coming out soon for my song Take Me To The Light, which I'm really excited about. And yeah, we're just gonna keep it moving over the summer really. Writing more, releasing more, hopefully some more exciting collaborations. And yeah, just enjoying the journey keep the momentum up yeah okay <laughs> well thank you for talking to me thank you enjoy for your coffee me. i will it's really good <laughs> it's cold now probably <laughs> sorry <laughs> bye